Hey there again, it's Dr. Peebler for another episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. I want to say, I hope you can bear with me for the lighting, shooting this after sunset, and I try not to avoid blue light after sunset when I'm not working. So if you can bear with me, I'd appreciate it. So I want to touch again on the idea and concept of cancer stem cells. And the last video on cancer stem cells, we talked about kind of their architecture and how they differ from the normal cancer cells. But what I really want to talk about is how they're created and how they lead to downstream effects such as tum the tumor microenvironment and metastases. So we talked about the last time we ended up on this slide, and I want to go to now talking about how a cancer stem cell is generated. So this is a very similar graphic than what we've seen recently, and that is that there are there is some insult, whether it be chemical agents, radiation, viruses, drugs, age, poor lifestyle, and a, a wide range of other things. As a matter of fact, we're going to be talking a great deal about how mitochondria are damaged during our mitochondrial redox portion of this series. But needless to say, there is some insult that damages mitochondria's ability to produce energy through oxidative phosphorylation. And that leads to a, a host of different things, one of which is excess ROS or reactive oxygen species. And ROS, as we'll talk about in the mitochondrial redox, can be good and act as signals, communication signals, or an excess can lead to genomic instability. And the way it does it is, is it damages the DNA, both inside the mitochondria, which creates a snowball effect of more reactive oxygen species, less ATP production, and additional genomic changes, which leads to further genomic instability. One thing that is highlighted here also is that ROS, and we'll talk about this in the future uh, when we specifically talk about HIF1-alpha, but ROS can be the signal by itself to activate this HIF1-alpha, and that leads to metabolic reprogramming, which leads us to go down to the Warburg effect, which then induces the classic tumor microenvironment. The next video that I put out will actually be specifically on lactate and the tumor microenvironment and how that drives further cancer growth and evasion of the immune system, but we'll talk about that soon. So essentially we have altered bioenergetics in the form of lack of ATP via oxfos, which leads to a host of issues, tumor genesis, genomic instability through ROS, RTG stands for retrograde signaling to the nucleus and an inability to have cell suicide to help protect itself from becoming cancer. That's called apoptosis, and that would be dysfunctional. That all leads to genomic instability, both mitochondrial and DNA found in the nucleus, genomic instability, which then ends up with inactivation of genes that suppress tumors, also known as tumor suppressor genes, and the overproduction or overexpression of the oncogenes or the genes that kind of drive cancer further. A lot of those genes have to do with ramping up glycolysis, interestingly enough, so that the cancer cell can live. HIF1-alpha is interesting because HIF, HIF stands for hypoxia inducible factor, 1-alpha, and it should be stimulated under the conditions of hypoxia or low oxygen, but when there's excess ROS, HIF1 can be stimulated in the absence of hypoxia in a normal oxygen environment under the name pseudohypoxia. This ends up driving further to tuber microenvironment, which then further simulates HIF-alpha. But the bottom line is, this is how it is proposed that the cancer stem cells ultimately form. This is a graphic design of a very similar process. You have some, let's call it carcinogen, some factor in the environment that leads to decreased oxidative phosphorylation, those same signals to the nucleus that leads to genomic instability, and also a retrograde genomic instability of the mitochondrial DNA, which leads to heteroplasmy, which we'll talk about shortly. And then that leads to the cancer hallmarks and the creation of cancer stem cells, which then leads to the formation of the tumor microenvironment and also the tumor niche and the tumor architecture that we've talked about previously. This is another picture of how as the oxidative phosphorylation 
pathways become become dysfunctional and unable to support cellular processes, that then leads to a heavy dependence on glucose and glutamine in which transporters for glucose and glutamine are upregulated and metabolized to then excrete excess succinic acid and lactic acid, which then in the extracellular component leads to an acidification of that environment, which becomes very problematic. We're going to talk about that in more depth in the next video. This is a stepwise approach at looking at how a cancer cell, a cancer stem cell forms, starts to construct the tumor microenvironment, TME, leads to the process of metastases and how the therapies that we currently use right now, surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation, how they attack the process. So let's start with the first one, which is what the, the picture we just left, which is you have some carcinogen that alters mitochondrial function and leads to decrease in the bioenergetics of cells. That creates a downstream effect on both the mitochondrial DNA and the, gen the genome found in the nucleus. This all starts to initiate the formation of the cancer stem cells. There's further cell division and differentiation where you start to form the tumor architecture, where you have a combination of more central cancer stem cells and more peripheral or on the outside non-cancer stem cells, which are rapidly dividing. These Both of these cells rely heavily on glu glycolysis and glutaminolysis, which is the metabolism of sugar and glutamine. That further acidifies and creates the tumor microenvironment. You have fusion events where cancer stem cells fuse with immune cells and lead to fusion hybridization, which leads to metastases. We then detect it somehow and make a diagnosis. And then there's a surgery, which is able to remove both cancer stem cells and non-cancer stem cells. You have a sequence of studies, MRI, CT, ultrasound, whatever it is, that's not, you, you fall below a detection threshold, but they're still there. And then when you be, become a detectable phenomenon, we use chemotherapy and radiation, which are able to affect the non-cancer stem cells that are rapidly dividing, but are not able to effectively destroy or kill or eradicate the cancer stem cells or these fusion hybridizations between the immune cells. They're proposed to be macrophages, which are immune cells, and these cancer stem cells, which leads to subsequent relapses and resistance to the therapies that worked earlier and leads to further disease burden and ultimately losing the fight in that particular case against cancer. So I hope this starts to make some sense about why our current therapies are likely failing. I think it also hopefully gives some hope because despite our current therapies not working on these cancer stem cells or fusion hybridizations, which end up being metastases or cells that travel away from the primary tumor and set up shop somewhere else in the body, we can find some solace that both types of cells will respond to metabolic therapies, which will remove the availability of glucose and glutamine, which will ultimately allow the tumor microenvironment to be less acidic and for our immune system to be able to take care of the remaining cancer cells, which is not able to happen under normal, normal circumstances. Under the next video, we're going to talk further about this TME or this tumor, tumor microenvironment in particular about the acidification of the tumor microenvironment and how that affects further tumor growth and the avoidance and evasion of our immune system. Until next time.